In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. You know, it's a good idea, I think, for us to, to remind ourselves that the gospel writers were not stenographers. They weren't reporters following Jesus around, writing down everything that Jesus was saying, preaching like the Beatitudes, for example, or the healings that he was doing, writing those down, recording, getting people's information. Now, where, do you, where are you from? How old are you? All of that. And not writing down the experience that other people had of them, watching that, and recording, like what's going on? How is that person responding? Or recording sort of the world events that happen around Jesus. The, the gospel writers were not that. If that were the case, the four Gospels would look much more similar, wouldn't they? I mean, we could say that they would be identical, but I think news folks today show us that not everybody tells the story the same way. But regardless, if they had been stenographers, the Gospels would have been much more similar. And in fact, they're very different. They're different in the order of things that they tell. John tells some stories that Matthew doesn't, and vice versa, all between all four. So it's helpful to, rem be, to be reminded that the gospel writers were storytellers. They took information that had been passed to them, most likely by word of mouth, stories that had been told to others, that had been told to others, that had been told to others until they received it. Maybe something written down, maybe a hymn or a song that a, that a community of followers of Jesus in certain parts had, had written and maybe shared with others and that came to them. But all of that information came to them and then they created their story. They wrote their story in particular to the community to whom they were writing. And in Matthew's case, he was writing to, the, to folks who were following Jesus, Jewish folks who were following Jesus in the area in which Jesus lived. And so he had a particular message in and among his stories and the way in which he shared it and the ways in which he would turn a phrase. I think that's helpful for us to remember. What I do know about this gospel reading that we just heard is that it is used often at ordinations. You hear it often at ordinations, and it makes sense, doesn't it? The, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so we sort of set these folks up as like, we're going to send you out to be the laborers. I hope we don't use it so much that it becomes only associated with those who wear funny shirts and collars that we all recognize that we are all a part of that gospel. But I do think we hear that gospel reading a lot in ordination services. I also think this about that gospel reading. If you're like me, I wonder, I wonder if you're like me, that at times you might hear the gospel story and think, where am I in this? Who am I? Am I the person that walks by on the road of, of, the, of, the, of the Good Samaritan? Or am I, what, who am I in this, in this gospel reading? I wonder if, in doing that and hearing today's gospel reading, perhaps, and I think this is true, I think it's true for you, I know it's true for me, that we come to worship on Sunday mornings in part often with things on our hearts that we might be struggling with, that we may be struggling with. This gospel reading for me, the end of the ninth chapter and the beginning of the tenth chapter of Matthew, for me is almost a synopsis of Jesus' ministry. Jesus has already given the, the Sermon on the Mount. He's healed from chapter 5 on. Healed folks, raised people from the dead, calmed storms. The, his followers have seen all of this, watched all of this. And then we come to this, ninth, this part in the ninth chapter where Jesus looks out on the crowd and has compassion on them. So if this story is a synopsis of Jesus' ministry, what I'm hearing in that is the very reason that God entered into this world in the person of Jesus was because of God's compassion and love for creation and God's desire to continuously pursue us and draw us back to God. I think that's what was happening with Jesus as God entered into the world in the person of Jesus. I think it still happens today. I believe it still happens today. That God pursues, pursues, pursues us. So that first part of the synopsis is Jesus looking out and having compassion because Jesus sees in the people the struggles in which they are having. They are harassed and helpless. Harassed and helpless. And Jesus sees in their heart the pains that they are struggling with. So he has compassion for them. And he's going to send out his followers 
to pronounce the kingdom of God has come near, that the love of God is standing near there with them, always pursuing them. To me, it's a synopsis of the whole Jesus story. Don't know that that's why Matthew wrote it, but that's what I hear in Matthew's writing. And I do think that we come into worship like the crowd that Jesus looked upon at times with heaviness about things that we're bringing. That we come to church worrying about an illness that we have or a family member has or the depression or anxiety that they may be going through or a very heavy decision that we have to make or we're concerned about our children climbing up rocks really high and are they being safe? Is the rope safe that they're using? Are the people that they're with? We worry about our parents and their aging. We worry about all these things and we bring them into worship appropriately so. Appropriately so. I hope also this morning that you will also leave here as I shared with our children with the knowledge that not just the 12 but that you are called by God to share God's love, that you are sent out to spread the kingdom of God, to pronounce that the kingdom of God has come near. Now, before you let a sense of inadequacy overwhelm you about that, thinking, my goodness, we just had this very serious announcement about who the 12 were. Matthew records it very seriously, gives a little bit of background on each of them, names them. Before you let the sense of inadequacy creeping in, it's like, I can't do that. That's not what I'm called to do. No, those were just the 12, or maybe that's just for the ordained when they read this lesson. Remember that they were just human, too. They were just human, too. And that perhaps they had a sense of inadequacy. Think of all that they had seen and heard. The Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, the cheesemakers, what's the special the attitudes, the healings, the calming the storms. You want me to go out and pronounce that? You're em em emboldening upon me the ability to heal and to raise? Certainly they felt inadequate and worried and wondered how they might do that. So this week I've been wondering like what sort of modern cultural thing might connect us with this, with this sense of feeling and being called out? What, what would help us do that? And it's over now, so I feel like I can do this. It's over, and if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll watch it, and I'll try not to be too much of a spoiler alert, but it's over, maybe there'll be a spinoff, don't know, but Ted Lasso. Some smiles and some nodding, Ted Lasso. Wonderful, wonderful series. If you haven't seen it, watch it. But if you haven't, very quickly, Ted Lasso is this American football coach from Kansas, Division II. He wins a national title. He's hired to go and coach soccer in the, in the England Premier League and of, of, and of coach football, soccer, football, and he knows nothing about it. Secretly, he's actually hired to fail. To fail is why he's hired. But he's hired and he goes and he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know a thing about, about soccer, about football. And in one of his early press conferences, he says that you can fill up two internets with what I don't know about football, <laughs> about soccer. That's sort of the folksy way in which this character lives at himself out in, 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 in the series. He was the last person that you would think that would be hired to coach a pro soccer team, but as I said, Secretly, it was so that he would fail, completely inadequate, except that he's specially gifted with the ability to love others, to love others, and to know the struggles that they are going through because of his own connection with his own struggles and his own challenges. And so he loves others more than he coaches. He loves them more than he coaches. One of my favorite quotes of Ted Lasso is when there's a particular player who sort of messed up in a game, sort of just lost it and really felt like he had caused the loss. It was all on him. There were 10 other players on the field. Am I right? Ooh, got, got it. I can fill up one internet with them. 10 other players on the field, but he's convinced he lost it. It's his fault. Ted Lasso pulls him aside and he says, you know what the happiest animal on earth is? 
the goldfish because it has a 10 second memory. <laughs> the player is like, oh, and then you, you see it sitting in. He says, go be a goldfish. Now from my Christian uh, filter in which I hear and see that, I hear redemption. I hear new opportunity, new life that the kingdom of God coming near presents to us. That we are always given the ability to turn and to come back into the ways in which God wants us to live and to, and to follow and to spread that kingdom of God. There's a sign that he places in the locker room over a door that says believe. Now that's probably not the first person to ever put the words believe in a locker room. I'm sure that that's the case. But again, in the undertones for me, in my filter in which I watch the show, there's, there's this, this symbolic nature of God's un, for, uh, unrelenting love and continuous desire for us to be reconciled and a belief in that and to carry that. Now, spoiler alert, that sign gets ripped apart a couple of times. But each time, it's put back together. Again, redemption. Things being fractured, brought together. That's what our message is that Jesus is giving us to share to the world. That things that are broken apart can be brought together in God's love. Our world is full of people who are helpless and harassed. People who lack food, who lack housing. People who are struggling for quality education. People who are attacked by politicians just because who they are. Our world is full of folks who prey upon the elderly and others. Our world is full of folks who struggle with mental health and the lack of the ability to find support for it. Our our world is full of violence, gun violence in particular. Number one reason, number one cause of the death of children 17 years and, and younger is gun violence. The vast minority of that are those which we see, those horrific events that horrify us in schools and settings. The vast majority are deaths by suicide and guns in the home or between family members and friends, people who know one another. Our world is full of that. Our part of the world, our part of the world is full of that. Just this past week, a counselor at our own camp, our own diocesan camp, in a car, she was supposed to be at camp this week serving as a counselor. She's in the car with her stepfather and a four-year-old, and someone mistaken identity pulls up and shoots, fills the car. He dies, the four-year-old's not injured. She's shot 13 times, her spinal spine is severed. 16 years old. We, the church, have things to say about the helpless and the harassed in this world. We have things to say about that and to do about that. Spoke to a group this past week, a school group, and one of the questions from them was, um, what do you think the impact of the church is? And I said, what do you think the impact of the church could be if we all lived in the way in which we're called to live to spread the kingdom of God, there would be no war. We would fill planes and fly to Ukraine by the millions and stand in front of those who are heaping violence upon others and say, not happening. The good news is, is that God always redeems us. When we fall short of this, when our inadequacy, do we worry about, come through and we fall short, God gives us an opportunity. There is always some, someone who is in need of hearing from you about God's love for them. There's always someone who is in need for you to stand with them and for them. So be empowered by this community. Be empowered by your fellow brothers and sisters who've come through the waters of baptism that you have. 
and look for the ways in which you and the gifts that God have bestowed upon you, not your neighbor, don't compare what, what they can do and what you can do, but for you, what gifts, what resources has God given you to go forth like the 12 and to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near to the harassed and helpless. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.